Yeah, thank you for the invitation to, to talk to you about um, our project uh, to map out the quark structure of uh, protons. I should start by saying uh, that I'm speaking for Caroline Riedel, who is the PI of uh, this grant and who has made uh, the slides. Caroline is at uh, CERN and uh, cannot be here as her green card uh, is uh, held up uh, at the State uh, Department. Um, so the proton is a complex object. Uh, some of you might know that initially we thought there are three valence quarks, uh, two up quarks and a down quark, but it, nothing could be further from the truth. It's a very complex object. There are strongly interacting force fields in uh, the nucleon, and therefore there are dozens and dozens of uh, virtual quark-antiquark pairs uh, that constantly are created and annihilate again and uh, which are very important uh, to take into account if one wants to understand the properties of uh, the proton. I first will give you an introduction of the physics of uh, proton uh, spin structure, proton uh, structure, and then uh, describe the experimental challenge. Uh, this is an experiment that uh, takes data 24 seven for uh, 220 days each year uh, for four years there's just an enormous amount of data that needs to be analyzed. And it turns out that Blue Waters uh, provides the resources that are uh, needed. And with these resources, we carry out what we call data production, Monte Carlo data production, and then uh, user analysis. The talk is organized according to the uh, questions. This is brief summaries uh, to look at um, offline. I want to start uh, discussing the uh, significance why does it uh, matter? And the way I want to lead you through the discussion is by making an analogy uh, to uh, historically uh, how we learned about the structure of hydrogen and then from this learned about quantum electrodynamics and understood how to make up in its uh, theory calculations of properties of atoms and in more modern times of uh, complex systems, molecules, even biological systems as we uh, learned in this uh, symposium or as we have heard in this symposium. So uh, studying hydrogen structure means uh, to determine what the wave functions of electrons are in the uh, atomic shell. And these wave functions um, can be uh, described uh, through quantum numbers that include orbital angular momentum and also spin. And we're familiar with how uh, wave functions uh, look like uh, for different spin states, for different orbital angular momentum states. Now, we ought to have a similar problem in uh, the proton. Um, we should be able to write down what the uh, wave functions of the quarks are uh, that make up uh, the substructure of the proton. Unfortunately, the situation is much more complicated. It's a strongly interacting uh, theory the perturbation techniques that we learned in QED don't work in QCD as the coupling constant is very large. Uh, the perturbation series uh, does not uh, break off um, anywhere soon. Um, so what we are doing right now is we are studying the proton and the neutron through high energy uh, scattering and we parameterize the cross section with uh, functions, we call them structure functions, that basically know about uh, the uh, quark structure, quark spin structure, and also in principle about uh, angular uh, momentum. Uh, here are examples for this uh, structure functions. For example, F1 is uh, the uh, momentum structure function. From it, we can learn what fraction of uh, uh, the proton momentum an up quark or a down quark or a strange quark uh, carries. Uh, then here, closer to what COMPASS does, is a uh, function that correlates transverse proton spin uh, with intrinsic transverse quark momentum. It's sort of a proton spin quark uh, transverse momentum uh, coupling. This is named uh, the Sivers function after the argon theorist who postulated the existence of this function first in 1991. Uh, Maybe I should mention uh, he's an interesting case. Uh, shortly after this paper, uh, there was a family emergency in the corporation that his parents owned. Uh, they passed away. He was forced to turn his uh, career as a theorist 
in, uh, through the career as a corporate CEO. Uh, this company is in Portland, Oregon. So I find it amusing uh, that the workshop is uh, near to where Dennis uh, Sivers is. Uh, I have met him, he still comes uh, to workshops. Uh, so it's his function that we uh, measure. And what we aim at is access to orbital angular momentum. Uh, this is something that's completely unknown as of now. What are the orbital angular momentum states of quarks inside uh, the uh, proton? Um, I want to uh, take this analogy a step further between QUD and uh, QCD. Uh, we have heard so many fantastic applications in this symposium, uh, doing uh, computational efforts on real world problems that will make a difference in uh, medicine or uh, in uh, material science. And I want to point out uh, that this is the pinnacle of a two century long uh, development. You might say, that the development of uh, QED started with the discovery of the Fraunhofer absorption lines in the solar light. Uh, if you look at those lines, you can extract all the information about hydrogen, about quantum mechanics. Obviously, it took 100 years uh, before uh, the theory uh, formed. Uh, actually, studying hydrogen structure uh, played an important role in this. And then it took another 80 years or so uh, before scientists uh, could really use this theory in complex real-world uh, systems. And I think we will go through a similar process uh, for uh, QCD. Uh, only in the 1930s, there were first indication by looking at large anomalous magnetic moments that protons may have a non-trivial substructure. Uh, the quarks that make up the substructure were discovered uh, by the uh, late uh, 60s. Uh, today, we are in a situation where precision experiments at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, at Compass, Jefferson Laboratory in Virginia may make it possible to drive uh, the theory effort that allows up initio calculations of uh, proton properties based on quarks, based on QCD. And then in some distant future, uh, hopefully, uh, we really can use this science uh, to describe uh, real world systems. For example, the cross-sections that are important in a fusion reactor. So how can we learn experimentally about transverse motion of quarks inside the proton? This is a picture that comes from theoretical models uh, that shows the transverse momenta in the X and a Y direction of up quarks in the proton. The center of the proton is here at zero, zero. Now imagine you're a high energy probe particle, such as a, a photon, and you encounter uh, an up quark that has a preferentially large intrinsic momentum to the right on this axis. Uh, this means that the final start state particles that are formed in the collision have a tendency to be deflected uh, to that side. Um, so it turns out that by carefully analyzing the azimuthal distributions of final state particles, we can infer what the intrinsic uh, transverse momentum of uh, the quarks must have been. Um, it turns out that this is a very challenging measurement compared to traditional measurements we have done in nuclear and particle physics, uh, because in addition uh, to looking at integral uh, distributions and transverse momentum and azimuthal and uh, polar angle distributions, we now have to map out all these distributions with enormous uh, precision, meaning we have to understand our detector effects at a level that is unprecedented. Um, we have two mechanisms in COMPASS uh, to uh, measure this sort of effects. We can either scatter high energy leptons, such as muons, of uh, proton targets, and then uh, we have a virtual photon that's exchanged, knocks out the quark we want to study, the quark fragments into a hadron that we detect. Or alternatively, we can select a beam of negative uh, pi minus uh, particles. They have a quark structure of an anti-up and a down quark as uh, valence quarks. And the anti-up quark then annihilates with the up quark that we would like to study inside the proton. And by looking at the angular distributions of the dilepton pair, two muons that are formed in the final state, we can co compute back uh, what this means for the transverse momentum of the up quark in the uh, proton. COMPASS is located uh, at uh, the center of the Large Hadron Collider, which is indicated here at CERN. This is located uh, north of Geneva in Switzerland. 
this is the airport. Uh, this is Lake uh, Geneva. Uh, it is a fixed target experiment uh, that is about 60 meters long with different instruments that aim at the detection of uh, final state uh, particles. It has been built and is being operated by 240 physicists from uh, 12 countries, uh, about 25 institutions from around uh, the world. Now, closer to the challenge where Blue Waters makes a really significant uh, difference, this large uh, spectrometer has a large number of instrumentation channels, uh, about 200,000. These are read out 40,000 times uh, per uh, second. Uh, some of them uh, actually take several samples in one readout cycle. And uh, this happens uh, around the clock, 220 days every uh, year. And that produces an enormous amount of uh, data. Uh, <clears throat> so we have 40,000 events per second, 20 kilobytes per event. Um, so this writes at about 800 megabytes uh, per second uh, to tape. We organize uh, our data into files. We call them chunks of one uh, gigabyte. So in a burst, uh, we have a file uh, roughly every uh, second. And then uh, this amounts uh, to about one petabyte of uh, raw data. Those are the experimental data taken from the detector. And then very importantly, it's necessary to produce a much larger quantity of Monte Carlo data uh, that lets us study systematic uncertainties and reduce the systematic uncertainties to a point where we can use the good statistical uh, precision that we have in the uh, experiment. Um, so what the COMPASS software does, on one side it takes the raw data, uh, which are basically charges, voltages, currents, times, and then uh, assembles them from different detectors to reconstruct trajectories of particles, to determine the momenta of particles, the energies, uh, positions. So the software fills tables that have physics-based information and then can be used uh, for a physics uh, analysis. And the same process then has to be uh, repeated on the Monte Carlo side, where we use event generators that know about the physics to generate uh, events. And uh, we then use a package Geant uh, that comes from CERN that knows about the interaction between uh, particles created and the matter in the detectors and can realistically uh, compute the response of the uh, detector. And uh, by doing this, uh, we now can analyze in detail uh, what the experimental condition or changes in the experimental condition uh, impacts on our measurement quantities. And by doing this, we can evaluate uh, systematic uh, uncertainties. So um, <coughs> the tasks uh, that we have in the analysis on Blue Waters uh, break down as uh, shown here. I should say that uh, we have posters uh, that match uh, some of these uh, tasks. Uh, so one is the raw data uh, production. There is a poster from Ricardo uh, Longo. Uh, this will, we think, uh, use about 20% of the resources on Blue Waters. Uh, there is the massive Monte Carlo production that uh, helps us reach this unprecedented precision. Um, this is shown in a, a poster by uh, Marco Meyer. And then uh, we also envision that uh, there will be user physics level analysis, and that is discussed in the poster uh, by uh, Robert Heitz. Um, one uh, critical aspect is the data transfer uh, from CERN to Blue Waters and uh, back uh, to CERN and also back to other institutions that want to use the high-level uh, user data uh, that we are produ uh, producing at the uh, physics uh, level. Now, maybe I can't quite uh, hold back saying uh, we're really very unfortunate with visa problems. Uh, Ricardo uh, Longo is an Italian citizen that I have hired uh, two months ago. Uh, his visa is held back by uh, the consulate in uh, Florence. Uh, the uh, consulate officer is concerned about his Russian collaborators. Uh, at CERN, we have very many Russian uh, collaborators. Uh, so we have two people out of our group who are presently not able uh, to travel to the United States. And I'm not an expert in this matters, but I'm not sure the reasons are really uh, justified. Um, so then uh, some of the uh, accomplishments. 
The first item uh, this is critical, which is critical and needs to be looked at is the data transfer uh, from CERN. Uh, we have uh, one petabyte uh, basically to move in uh, both uh, directions. It can be two petabytes in uh, certain years. This was studied already with exploratory allocations that we had in previous uh, years. And it basically turns out uh, the data at CERN are at uh, Castor. This is taped uh, storage, but of course they are staging disks. If the data is staged uh, on disk, uh, we can reach 1.5 gigabytes uh, per second uh, sustained. If we write uh, from tape and then, if we copy from tape and send uh, to Urbana, then uh, we have 250 megabytes uh, per, per second. Um, an important uh, detail is uh, the management of all the uh, production jobs and uh, analysis uh, jobs. This is done uh, by uh, Panda, a system that was uh, developed originally uh, for the ATLAS experiment at uh, LHC. Um, and this may be difficult to explain quickly, but with this vast amount of data and uh, basically uh, 200 users who may be using this data in different combinations, it's extremely important to manage the output uh, well and in, uh, also in particular to carry out a QA uh, that makes sure that the data production was carried out with high quality. Um, this is exactly what Panda does. So it does not just submit jobs, it also looks at the output, including higher level uh, physics observables, uh, making sure that uh, the production uh, was successful. And it's very critical for us uh, that uh, Panda uh, can be uh, running. Panda is running outside the Panda server of uh, Blue Waters so that it also can talk uh, to other computing systems that are used by other uh, Compass users for analysis in different uh, countries. And that actually has led uh, to some uh, challenges uh, allowing uh, sufficient communication uh, between uh, the Panda server um, the external Panda server and the pilot, the Panda pilot at uh, Blue Waters. So after uh, we, we got a lot of support from uh, Blue Waters and after some discussion, I think this is the uh, production scheme that was agreed upon uh, for data uh, production. Uh, so one Panda pilot uh, creates or is uh, one submission to Blue Waters uh, queues and this is a submission uh, to 16 nodes with uh, 32 uh, processors each. Uh, each process is running uh, one of our files or data chunks with one uh, gigabyte. Uh, this typically takes between 15 to 20 uh, wall hours um, and between 240 and 320 uh, node hours. And then uh, one submission campaign is to submit 384 uh, such uh, jobs. Uh, this uses up to 120,000 node hours and a total of 6,000 nodes basically for one day. Um, and if we have five such uh, submission uh, campaigns, uh, we basically manage uh, to produce a whole year of uh, Compass raw data, meaning uh, turning this raw instrumentation information into physics uh, quantities. And that is really a big game changer for us uh, so far. Uh, assuming uh, we got the priorities on the CERN uh, computing facility, it took 50 days uh, with CERN uh, computing. Um, one thing I should explain, uh, getting the best uh, results in terms of detector performance and systematics, it is necessary to carry out two or three of these iterations uh, where one uh, improves uh, the quality of uh, the uh, data uh, production. So this is an enormous uh, gain uh, in uh, speed uh, and I think it leads to uh, increased ability to understand systematic effects and to, uh, to reduce them. So here's a first uh, example uh, where this was uh, already used, even though this is a new allocation in a publication. Uh, we have a first result on the Sivas function from our 2015 data. And uh, our signal are uh, pairs of muons that come from uh, what we call the Drillian process. But there are many other processes that produce uh, these muons as well. For example, the production of uh, JPsi that's indicated here, the production of the Psi prime uh, here, uh, then combinatorial background, uh, combinatorial background uh, combined with an open charm uh, event. And uh, we show this here only in one dimension, invariant mass. 
but it's important uh, to know this background uh, in uh, other uh, parameters as well uh, that enter uh, the analysis. So the, for the first time, we have this precision uh, blue water data available uh, for understanding our systematic error. Uh, this here is a, a schedule that shows how Monte Carlo for different background channels was uh, produced in March, uh, April, and uh, May. A scheme very similar to the one I showed for data production. So if this is underway, it uses between 20 and 25% of uh, the CPUs at uh, Blue Waters. Of course, that's not running at all times, uh, but I think that's the scheme uh, that was agreed upon. This also is being used in our uh, Drillian cross-section uh, analysis. Um, this here is shaded because uh, we are not really allowed to show this uh, result. Uh, but this is a prime example uh, where we have now enormous statistics in uh, measuring uh, acceptances, uh, so detector performance that affect our analysis in uh, many different uh, dimensions. So, so it's a five-dimensional uh, analysis. Then it has been used uh, by uh, Robert Heitz, uh, who is uh, giving a poster later today uh, to improve uh, the alignment of our detector. The 60 meters of detectors consists out of 350 planes of detectors that had to be aligned to a few microns. Uh, this cannot be achieved with uh, lasers uh, only. Uh, one needs to use actually physics data and then optimize uh, the positions, the initial positions that come from laser alignment. It has been used by one of our postdocs uh, in Illinois, Monson Andreu, uh, to optimize uh, the parameterization of transverse momentum in the uh, event uh, generators. And it's also being used uh, by Robert Heitz in his uh, thesis uh, physics analysis. One interesting example uh, that became possible through uh, Blue Waters, um, in order to get this high precision, we need to stretch the beam intensity uh, to the utmost highest. Um, and we actually every year get very close to setting off uh, the end of year radiation alarm where we would be forbidden uh, to continue uh, further running because the exposure to off-site uh, uh, you know, spectators uh, would be too high. Um, and so one challenge is to arrange a uh, broad uh, set of concrete absorbers, polyethylene absorbers, lithium absorbers in the best possible way to reduce uh, this background and then be able to further increase uh, the intensities. And with the computing that we had at CERN, we never were able uh, to carry out Monte Carlo uh, simulations using Fluca uh, that would give us enough precision uh, to uh, do this. And that now has been possible uh, with uh, Blue Waters. And for the first time this year, we run with what we consider uh, the best uh, possible uh, shielding uh, configuration, uh, increasing our uh, statistical uh, precision as we can run uh, with higher uh, beam intensities. Uh, then here is an example uh, that is already in a thesis result, Ricardo Longo, the postdoc that we hired uh, two months ago. And uh, what's shown here, uh, acceptance uh, curves. So this shows how the detector is non-uniform in its response over the kinematic plane. And if one can measure this non-uniform response in the Monte Carlo with sufficiently high precision, one can correct for it and uh, improve the precision. And uh, without really going in detail of what's being measured here, uh, but what you should look at uh, are this uh, arrow bands. Uh, the brown arrow bands in this row are the arrow bands from systematic errors without blue waters. And then the blue ones uh, are the ones that become possible uh, through this first uh, submission of Monte Carlo jobs. Um, which is a fraction of what we intend uh, to do. Uh, so it really gets us to a point uh, where we are limited by the statistical errors and not uh, by uh, systematic uh, errors. So why blue waters? Uh, I think um, this here are the most important uh, general comments one uh, can make. Uh, so one can generate Monte Carlo samples at an unprecedented uh, level that allows uh, very complex multidimensional analyses and still makes it possible uh, to constrain uh, systematic uh, uncertainties with very good uh, precision. And that then in the end allows us to look at the spin 
transverse momentum correlations of quarks inside the proton with the best possible experimental uh, precision. Uh, yeah, so this is important for the studies of spin transverse momentum correlations in the uh, proton and the reduction of systematic uncertainties. And it actually turns out that uh, certain studies uh, are not possible without this uh, computing power. Uh, so for example, the shielding study that has increased our intensity uh, further. Um, and then uh, one big problem uh, we have, we have a large number of uh, graduate students. Um, in nuclear physics, unfortunately, the time to graduation sometimes is long. It uh, has to do often with the computing resources that are uh, available. I think uh, this will allow us, our students to finish their thesis in a timely fashion. It allows us to actually carry out all the physics one possibly can do with COMPASS in uh, the time limit that's set by our grants that support the uh, manpower. Um, so I think uh, Blue Waters is uh, critical in uh, getting uh, the optimum use of uh, COMPASS, uh, both in the number of physics channels that one can work on and the precision of uh, the results, uh, plus a few new uh, items uh, that we can uh, measure. Here's a complete list of uh, the projects that are already uh, going on. I think presently there are 28 uh, Compass users that have uh, Blue Waters uh, accounts. This number will still increase. I believe there are also users that do not necessarily uh, uh, do physics analysis on Blue Waters, but that look at uh, Monte Carlo and uh, physics data that have been brought back to CERN or brought back to Lyon, a French computing center that we use, or back to the INFN in Torino. Uh, that uh, has also a, a computing um, center. And I think uh, this brings me to products. Um, so, so far, uh, our grant is relatively new. Uh, there's one publication um, where uh, Blue Waters Monte Carlo already has been used. This is the first measurement of uh, the Sivas effect in uh, Drillian. Um, I think uh, there are 20 talks at international conferences that were given uh, with um, this result. And then there are some uh, effective uh, changes. Uh, Blue Waters has allowed us to improve uh, the shielding. Um, we also have adapted the software and the environment as needed uh, for the massive uh, data transfer. In terms of uh, broader impact, uh, we think that this is an outstanding environment to train our uh, students in uh, petascale computing and uh, computing with uh, large uh, data uh, samples. This is good for science. We know from experience it's also good for finance. Maybe unfortunately many of the students end up at uh, uh, Wall Street. Um, and uh, then uh, I think uh, Blue Waters enables a very broad community of scientists uh, that actually look at this data also elsewhere as we uh, transport this back uh, to servers at uh, institutions uh, who collaborate uh, with us. And we want to say thank you to the whole uh, Blue Water system. Uh, we know that uh, some of the things uh, we are doing uh, came with uh, complications or irritations, maybe using uh, too much of the uh, resources. And we are really thankful uh, that uh, the Blue Waters team always has been very helpful in trying to find solutions. And uh, we hope that uh, soon we can be at uh, the production speed, both for Monte Carlo and data uh, that we have proposed originally. Mm -hmm.